Hello and welcome to a new video about standard elements, controller engineering. This time we are going to talk about a standard element, a base element, which helps us to get our pure elements a little bit more to a realistic matter. Yeah? We are talking about a delay element. A delay element will simply slow down the things. Basically we are talking about a delayed proportional element. Yeah? We're talking about a delay element first order. Okay, this is our our topic today. Delay element first order or PT1 element. Yeah. So P already shows that this is a proportional element, and T. One shows it's a first order delay element. Okay. What is a first order delay element? Well, I'll give you one example. A first order delay element is something which a system which contains one major energy storage and this energy storage needs to be filled up and then we can see the reaction at the output. One example would be cooling, hmm? heat sink. If we think about a heatsink looking like this somehow, there is an aluminium heatsink. And we add to this heatsink a certain power. Then this heatsink will start to heat up. Yeah? So we will reach a certain temperature here, a certain excessive temperature above the ambient temperature. Yeah? And because it's an excessive temperature, this aluminium will start to radiate heat. Yeah? So this is how a heatsink is working. Important things which you need is the mass of this. Yeah? So we say the mass of our aluminium heatsink shall be 0 0.7 kilograms. Yeah? Uh, then we also need the heat capacity of aluminium. The heat capacity of aluminium is 897 joule by kilogram and Kelvin. Yeah? And then we need the so-called thermal resistance, yeah? RTH. This somehow is specifying how many power it can radiate uh, if there's a certain amount of excessive temperature. Uh, so this shall be 1.5 Kelvin per watt. Okay. Now let's come, let's talk about the math behind. Okay. So we have this, this power which we add to the heatsink. It's absolute, this is some waste power, something like this, from a system, yeah, from a gearbox or whatever. Yeah. So we're adding this power and we're radiating power. Yeah. The radiated power at a certain point in time t yeah, is the excessive temperature at this point t yeah, divided by the thermal resistance. Yeah, that's the radiated power. That's the power we had. That's the power we we give away from the viewpoint of, of the heatsink. Yeah? So this means that the, the total power which will stay in the heatsink, which will is available to heat the heatsink up or cool it down, yeah, is the added power, yeah, minus the radiated power, which actually is the added power, yeah, minus this excessive temperature divided by the thermal resistor. This is the amount of power which is available to heat up the heatsink. Huh? So, if it's positive, 
it will heat up. If it's negative, it will cool down. So if this total power is there for a certain amount of time, yeah, this is the energy which I'm going to add in this amount, in this delta T amount of time. Yeah, and this will heat up yeah, our, our heat sink by a delta temperature multiplied by the mass and by the warmth. Huh? This is Kelvin, this is kilograms, Mult remains Joule. Here we have watts multiplied by seconds, also Joule. Fits. Huh? So this, this actually is, is the math. Yeah? And I'm now using this term instead of this total power. Yeah? So we're ending up in okay. Now I will simply divide by this uh, delta t. Yeah? So what is actually written here, I will also rewrite this, I will write M aluminium multiplied by C aluminium multiplied by delta excessive temperature divided by delta T yeah. and now at this side there is left the power I will now multiply with RTA. Oh, I will simply bring this to the other side also. So then we have 1 divided by RTH multiplied by the excessive temperature. Yeah, multiplied by the excessive temperature uh, plus M aluminium, C aluminium multiplied by the change of the excessive temperature. Okay. I will now do a differential equation out of this because delta divided by delta, if I make this an infinitesimal small amount, this delta t, this will be d, yeah, and I will also multiply with RTH. Yeah? So what basically remains is This is a typical equation, differential equation, of a delay element first order. Very typical. Let's have a look how a delay element first order looks like as transfer element. So here's our PT1 element. There is again an input. There is again an output. Xi from T, XO from T. Okay. In our case, XO is the excessive temperature. Huh? This is XO. Huh? And Xi from T is the added power. So we add, we want to get rid of power. What is the result? What is the over temperature? Okay. Now, if we again bring this to Laplace area, so if we say Xi from S and Xo from S, yeah, and then here we have a certain Gs. Yeah, Let's see how this works now. Now let's 
write this as Laplace transformation. Yeah? So here we have XO from S plus something. Yeah? This one I will call now the constant T. Mm -hmm. Simply call it a constant T. And now we have here a derivation. So, and I again assume all in the beginning everything is zero. So, it's zero over temperature, zero change rate of the over temperature, zero change rate of the changes, and so on. So, we'll simply multiply this with S and have here XO from S. And this one I will call K. So to, to be away from, from, from some terms to make it more common like. Yeah? So we have then k multiplied by xi from s. Yeah? And then of course I want to have the form xo equals something multiplied with xi. Well something with xi. Here I need to get rid of this whole other part. So I will take out xo. What remains inside is 1 plus st equals k multiplied by xi from s. So xo from s equals xi from s multiplied by k divided 1 plus st. Mm -hmm. So this actually is the transfer function gs. Yeah. This is the typical transfer function of a first delay of a delay element first order. Okay. This is how this looks like. Now let's do do again our observation what it means with as complex number and so on. And so we will start simply with what we just where's the brown stiff? Uh, we said our g from s is k divided by 1 plus st. Okay. That's it. So what it means for our uh, frequency response. k from j omega equals k 1 plus j omega t. Okay. Let's calculate the absolute value. Absolute value equals absolute value from k is k divided by the absolute value of 1 plus j omega t. Yeah. And this is k divided by square root 1 squared plus omega t squared, which is actually k divided by the square root of 1 plus omega t squared. That's the absolute value. Huh? What it means for the argument? Yeah. The argument Well, that's the argument of the above number, which is zero degree, minus, and now the arcus tangens of the imaginary part omega t divided by one. Yeah. So actually this is means minus arcus tangens from omega t. Why is that? Yeah. Let's have a look at our imaginary and real axis again. Here's the real axis, here's the imaginary axis. Let's have a look at this term. Yeah. Let's have a look at this term, k. Where is k? k is here. So this is one number. And now let's have a look at this term. Here's one, I say, one. And here it will go up to omega t. So this is the other part. This is this part. Yeah? And if we take a look, if we want to calculate this angle here, yeah? so we need to have 
the arcos tangents of this divided by this, uh, omega t, here we have omega t, the length is omega t, divided by 1. This is, why is this? And why is this minus? Because it's simply down there. Uh, this is why it's minus. And if we want to, to know the length of this, yeah, then I've used the Pythagoras. Yeah, so 1 squared plus this side, omega t squared, and the square root of it is the absolute value here, is the length of this. Yeah. So this is how, how this looks like. Yeah. Let's have again a look what it means if we are going at omega equals zero and omega equals infinity. Yeah? What it means for the absolute value and for the argument. At omega zero, yeah? here we have zero, k divided by one, so the absolute value remains k. Yeah. If omega is zero, this will be one here. Yeah. k divided by one is k. Okay. If omega is unlimited, very high, yeah, then we will, this will be very high. So one plus very high is very high and the square root of very high is also very high. Uh, doesn't really matter. Yeah. So this something divided by a very high number is zero. Yeah? So going into extremes with infinity, yeah? the absolute value will get zero. Now let's have a look at the argument. Yeah? The argument, yeah? if omega is zero, arcus tangens for zero is zero. Yeah? So the argument of k for j zero is zero degree, yeah? and the, ar the arcus tangents of unlimited is 90 degree. Okay, so this means, because you can easily see it, if this omega t is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and is going to infinity, this, this uh, number will get close to 90 degree, and because it's minus, boop, it's minus 90 degree. So, from J unlimited, we will stay at minus 90 degree. Okay. This is, these are the extremes. Okay. Well, let's have a look at the step response and at the, at the frequency response. We are talking about a PT1 element here. The transfer function from the, of the PT1 element is k divided by 1 plus st. Yeah. And okay. This is how this looks like, yeah? and we said the absolute value equals, here we have it, k divided by square root of 1 plus oh, 1 plus omega t, okay, squared, oops, of course. Here we have it. Yeah. And the argument is the arcus tangents minus arcus tangents, of course, yeah, because we have zero minus and then omega t. Let's first again have a look at the at the step response. At the beginning, nothing will happen, yeah? because if the input is zero, it will, it will stay zero. Yeah? And now, now something is going to happen. Here we said, in the first, if we have a steep reaction, 
yeah, and we have now unlimited steep, yeah, then we have high frequency, unlimited frequency, because it's, it's a jump. Yeah. At jump, we have the output zero. So this means nothing else will change here. Yeah. And then, after the frequency is getting smaller, if the echoing of this frequency is away, let's say, we will reach again zero frequency, and then zero frequency, the absolute value will be k. The input is now 1, and 1, 1 multiplied with k is k. So I will again use 3 here as an example. Yeah. So somewhere in time, we will reach this 3. Here we have k. Okay. And if we bring this, we bring this with the Laplace transformation into time area and so on, we will end up in the following form. Yeah? Exactly after a time t. It's this t here, huh? this t. We will reach around uh, 63%. Somewhere here. After 2D, we are a little bit higher. After 3D, we are almost there. After 4D, we are also almost there. After 5D, we are practically there. Yeah. And also, this one, yeah, the steepness T is now 10 in my example. Yeah. And where we reach the, the static end value 3, this line here, this would be. The steepness at the beginning of the curve. Yeah? So here we this is an asymptote at the beginning, and then we will slowly reach the final number. And after five t's, now here it's 50, after five t's, we will stay stable at k. Okay. This is how this would look like. We had this, we had this PT1 element, Verzögerungsglied erster Ordnung, we call it there, uh, delay element first order, in Measurement. Yeah? We had this in measurement. No, now you know the math behind. Yeah? Now you know the transfer function of this. Yeah? Okay. Now let's have a look at the, at the uh, frequency response. Well, at low frequencies, the argument must be zero. At high frequencies, the argument must be minus 90 degree. So here at low frequencies, yeah, we are somewhere at zero. And at high frequencies, we are somewhere at minus 90 degree. Okay. At low frequencies, we are at k. At high frequencies, we are at 0. So at low frequencies, we are at 3. 1, 2, 3. So somewhere here. And at high frequencies, we'll, we will drop somehow. Huh? I touched it now. Ooh. Sorry. So at high frequencies, we will drop. There is one characteristic frequency of a PT1 element. And this characteristic frequency, omega g, is exactly at 1 divided by t. 1 divided by the... Uh, time constant t. It's the so-called characteristic frequency or cutoff frequency, a limiting frequency. Yeah, why it's called cutoff or limiting, we will see. And now, what does it mean for our absolute value? If here this omega is 1 divided by t, it's 1 plus 1, it's square root of 2. k divided by square root of 2. So we are square root of 2 smaller, which would be somewhere here. Yeah? Omega g in my case, 1 divided by 10 is a tenth, so here we have omega g. Yeah? And we are square roots of 2 factor lower. Okay? This simply comes out here. Yeah? 1 plus 1 is 2, square root of 2, past. Yeah? What does it mean for argument? Argument if this is 1 divided by t, multiplied by t is 1, arcus tangens for 1 is 45 degree. 
minus arcus tangens for 1 is minus 45 degrees. So here we had minus 45 degree. Here's minus 45 degree. So here we're going to change. And I can tell you, if this omega here is 10 times higher, then it's about 10 times less, because the higher this omega gets, the less important is this one here. Yeah, then it's, you know, if it's 1 plus 100, it's a little bit. If it's 1 plus 1000, it doesn't really matter anymore. If it's 1 plus 10,000, it also doesn't really matter anymore. So here we're going to end up in a situation at high frequencies where the, the argument is dropping factor 10 higher frequency, factor 10 lower, lower outcome. Yeah? So if I want to show this here in my Bode plot, I will simply draw here the line starting from omega g down here. This is how this looks like. And if we would draw it now, point by point, if we enter omega 0 0.0001, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, and calculate always the, argument, the, the absolute value and the argument, we would end up in a situation like this, that here we are almost there, yeah, because then it's that small that only this one is the leading factor. Yeah. Here, this is that big that this one doesn't really matter, so we end up here. Yeah. And in between we have some sort of transition yeah, where we exactly be at the at the characteristic frequency, the cutoff frequency, factor square root of 2 lower than k. Hmm? We also had this in, in, in measurement, at the dynamic behavior of measurement system. Yeah? There we just learned it, now you know the math behind. Again, I have to mention it, because it all fits together in the end. Well, uh, and here the argument, we will start somewhere here at zero. Yeah? Then we will go down, pinching here minus 45 degree, and then we will slow down and slowly reaching, but never exceeding, minus 90 degree. This is how this looks like. And now it's also, also clear why this is also called cutoff frequency or Grenzfrequenz in German. Because starting from here, we will simply drop yeah, in a double logarithmic scale. It really looks like a bend, sharp bend. Now let's interpret this somehow. Uh, let's interpret this somehow. Let's have a look what is inside our T yeah, in our example. Uh, what was inside the T of our in our example? Well, this was T. There was the mass of the aluminium. Yeah, there was the the how easy it can be heated up. Yeah, and there was the thermal resistance. Yeah. The higher the mass the higher the, temp the, the higher the factor t. So t is the so-called time constant. Yeah. If the time constant is very high, then this characteristic frequency will be very low. If the time constant is rather short, then this characteristic frequency is very high. Yeah. So this is what it shifts. What does it mean? Well, if I slowly heat this up, and then cool it down again. And then if it turn off and on here this, this power, then we are in this area somewhere here. Yeah? Then it will heat up to full extent and cool down also to full extent. Yeah? So we have here constant behavior. Maybe a little bit a little bit delayed. Yeah? This is why this is negative, because as first start to heat it up, then it will heat up, so it will be delayed. This is why this this argument is negative. Yeah? And if we are on the other end, we will turn off and on this, this, this power here very fast. And so this will simply not react. It will, you know, it will heat up a little bit and already cool down, heat up a little. So here the result 
will not be that high anymore. Huh? So, and the faster I turn it off and on, the less the less ripple I will have here. Yeah? This shows this shows the impact on this on the change rate on the on the change amplitude. Okay. So, and it's clear: the bigger the the heatsink is, the slower it will heat up. Yeah? And if I use another material which is not that easy to be heated up, yeah, then it will also slowly heat up. Yeah, PT1 element. This is how this looks like. I promised something. I said there are the pure elements. And I already said there are only three. And now I'm telling you this. Uh, this is looks also pure, right? We have not used it. However, I can show you or I can explain to you. We can build a PT1 element with our pure elements. Uh, if we have something like this, uh, so there is a P element. Okay. Uh, then there's an I element. One divided by ST. Uh, and now if I'm if I'm connecting those in a certain way exactly like this and this now is XI and this here is XO from S in this case already because I already wrote here. Yeah. Then I I tell you this behaves like a PT1 element. Yeah. Let's check it. Let's check if I'm right. This I will call this XD. Yeah. This XD is from S of course yeah. is xi multiplied by k minus xo I always forget this s yeah. minus xo mm -hmm. this xd and our xo equals xd multiplied by this transfer function yeah. Now let's use this term. Here's xt. Yeah. So this is 1 divided by st multiplied by xi from s multiplied by k minus xo from s. Yeah. I will multiply with st. So here is then stxo equals xi from s multiplied by k minus xo from s xo to the other side so there is xo plus stxo equals xik now get out xo 1 plus st equals xi now get this to the other side and again xo from s equals xi from s k divided by 1 plus st Whee! pt1 element so you see pt1 element is already somehow a combination of other elements this combination will these combinations yeah, in different forms we will now proceed Next time we're going to combine a D element with a PT1 element. It's then a DT1 element. Yeah? What a DT1 element does, yeah? we will see in the next video. For this time, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.